just give you praise and honor and we thank you. Thank you for another opportunity to come together and to come into your house and fellowship with one another and to worship you and to study your word. Father, we just love you so much. We thank you, Father, for your healing power. We thank you that we are healed in every area. We are, our, our hearts are mended. Our bodies are whole. We have plenty of money and we walk in victory every day. And we thank you, Father God, for it's through your sacrifice of your son that is all possible now father as we study your word tonight we thank you for revelation knowledge flowing freely unhindered uninterrupted by any satanic or demonic spirit we thank you father god that we decrease and you increase all of you and none of us anoint every ear in here to hear your word every heart to receive it and every spirit to contain it father i thank you that no one sits in here in pain or in discomfort i thank you father that as your word flows signs and wonders accompany your word we thank you father and we give you praise and we'll be ever so mindful to always give you the praise and always give you the glory it's in jesus name everyone in agreement say amen if you have your bibles hold your bibles up hallelujah praise and we're gonna do a confession here we're gonna i want you to repeat after me say this is my bible i am what it says i am I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Tonight, I will be taught the uncompromising word of God. My life shall be changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, we're teaching on living victoriously over fear. We have so many opportunities, so many chances where we can be come overcome by fear. But we're to overcome fear. We've talked about all the negative things that fear does. We talked about how fear can affect us uh, emotionally, physically, uh, socially, and spiritually. Now we're talking about getting to the root of the matter. A lot of times we put a band-aid on things. We don't, we don't really get to the root, the cause of why things happen. But you know, in, in uh, Ecclesiastes 7.25, Solomon say, I, seek, I search and seek out the reason for things. We have access of the wisdom of God where we can find out why things happen. We don't have to feel around in the dark and wonder why these things happen. We have the wisdom of God on the inside of us that we can access and find out why these things are happening. But, it, but we have to put forth effort. We have to spend time with God and in his word. Amen. So we're looking at, we're identifying some things that may cause us to become fearful. And we're talking now about the thought of death. We said that the thought of death can cause us to become fearful. The thought of death has attached to it a fear of death that can cause us to become fearful of dying. But as believers, we read in Hebrews chapter 2 that Jesus came in the flesh and he destroyed the devil who had the keys of death. So if Jesus has defeated the devil who has the keys of death and we're in Christ, then we share in his victory. Death no longer has a hold on us because when he was raised from the dead, he defeated death. All right? So because we're in him, death, is, death does not have a hold on us. We recognize that to leave this, this physical body is to live eternally with Christ. And, and if you really think about it, no one actually dies in the sense of, of, of death as we think about it. Only, only your physical body dies, but you, who, which are a spirit, lives forever. It's just where you choose to live. We call it the smoking and the non-smoking. All right. We're going to the non-smoking. We're not going to the smoking. Even when I sit in the restaurant, I don't sit around people that smoke. Okay. So we don't want to go to the smoking. <laughs> and if you accepted Jesus, then you don't have to worry about that, all right? All right, so we were studying um, 
Hebrews 2, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, where he said that Jesus came in the flesh and destroyed the works of, I mean, destroyed the devil and took the keys from him. We're going to pick it up, I think, in your syllabus is page 21. I had to look at Arlen's syllabus to know where I was. That's all. Arlen Smart, she keep notes on where we stopped and, and started at. So I had to, I had to peek, I had to, I had to peep at her notes to see where we stopped at. <laughs> so I'm glad she left her syllabus here. <laughs> but we're going to pick it up on page 21, and, and we're going to start where it says, uh, Satan's power over death has been taken away. Y'all see that? On page 21, that's where we're going to start at, all right? It says, Satan po Satan's power over death has been taken away from him. This was the ultimate purpose of Christ coming in the flesh to destroy the power and works of the devil. Now, see, that's why I have a problem when people say God put sickness on them or God caused calamity in their lives. All that stuff comes from the devil. And the Bible says that Jesus came to destroy that, those kind of works. So if he came to destroy those kind of works, why would he use those works? That's like you, if you came into your child's life and destroyed drugs out of your child's life because you didn't like drugs, why would you take those same drugs and put them on somebody else? You understand what I'm saying? See, he didn't, <laughs> it's not God that's doing the, the evil. It's the devil. And we have to recognize that because if we say it's God, Satan and God doesn't work together. They're, they're in opposition. So if God is doing the bad, then that means the devil doing the good. <laughs> if we're going to use that kind of logic, that's what you have to look at it because they never work together. They're always in opposition. All right, so if you're saying God is putting the sickness and doing the evil, then Satan is providing the healing. <laughs> Praise Jesus. I ain't crazy. I know what I'm saying. <laughs> In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it reads, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The devil uses the fear of death to enslave people. However, through his death, Christ eliminated such fear and freed us from the bondage of sin and death. See, sin and death is the product of fear. Sin and death produces fear. I should say it like that. Sin and death produces fear. Okay? So because we have accepted Jesus, we are free from this, the law or the power of sin and death. You don't have to sin and you don't have to give in to all the uh, everything that comes along with death. You don't have to give in to it. You don't have to give in to poverty. You don't have to give in to sickness and disease. See, all those things come with death. Because we have victory over them. But you have to start opening your mouth because that's where the power of life and death is. Jesus took it from the devil and he gave us authority in our words. When we speak his word and release his word into the earth, we get positive or godly results. But if we get godly results when we speak the word of God, what happens when we speak the world's word? We're going to get devil results. Because the devil is the God of this world. So when you talk about sickness all the time, when you exalt sickness all the time, when you exalt poverty all the time, that's what you're going to experience. You frame your world with your words. Your world is framed by what you say. Amen? My world is prosperity, health, youth, good looks, <laughs> guapo <laughs> bata <laughs> guapo is handsome bata young you know <laughs> those are my words okay <laughs> in Romans 8 and 2 it reads for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death we are free from it. So you can't, you, you no longer can say the devil made me do it. 
No, you made you do it. That's who made you do it. You. You chose to do it. Because you got power over the sin and death. <laughs> the spirit of life that Paul mentioned in this verse is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was present at the creation of the world and he was the power behind and he's the power behind the rebirth of every Christian and he gives us the power we need to live the Christian life. He's with us everywhere we go. We God's presence is on the inside of us through the Holy Spirit. And he's empowered us to walk in victory. Amen? Amen. By placing our trust in Christ, we, we are set free from Satan's evil grasp. Now, 1st Thessalonians, 2nd Thessalonians chapter 3 and 3 says that God is faithful to keep us from the evil one. But I want to go to 1st John chapter 5 and verse 18, and I want to read it from the Amplified. This is real good. I want to point something out in here too. 1st John chapter 5 verse 18 hallelujah hallelujah this is going to bless you now first john 5 18 if you have it say i have it i'm reading from the amplified bible okay so it's going to sound a little bit different it says, and we know absolutely that anyone born of God does not deliberately and knowingly, the Amplified Bible says, practice committing sin. When you are saved, you don't deliberately practice sin. And he's going to tell you why. But the one who was begotten of God. Now we think that's talking about us, but it's talking about Jesus. And the Amplified Bible points that out. It says, but the one who was begotten of God watches over and protects him, talking about us. Christ's divine presence, watch this, within him, within us, preserves us, it, it says him, but I'm using the term us, preserves us against the evil. That's why we don't sin. Christ's presence on the inside of us preserves us from sin. It preserves us from evil. When you get ready to sin, the Holy Spirit says, ho, 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 ho. That's not what you're supposed to do. That's not God's way. See, he's telling you what you're supposed to do. He brings to your remembrance the word of God. Uh, Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart so that I will not sin against God. Uh, John 14, 26 says the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance his word. So when I get ready to do something that's contrary to the word of God, the Holy Spirit nudges me. He tells me, he gently tells me, this is not what you're supposed to do. This is how he preserves us. But now we have a choice at that moment. Once he tells you what not to do, he's not going to override your will. That's why you can't override nobody else's will. You know, we say that we want to pray. Let's say you know somebody got a demon in them. And you say, well, we're going to pray to cast that demon out. Well, if they don't want that demon out, that demon ain't coming out. You can't override they will, their will. That's why Jesus asked them, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be set free? You know, you can't override another person's will. So, so God doesn't override our will. But he shows us through the Holy Spirit what's right and wrong. So when we... Are, are, are nudged by the Holy Spirit he says that uh, if we do what the Holy Spirit tells us to do he keeps us from evil he keeps us from sin but watch this now watch what it says he says uh, Christ's divine presence within him within us preserves us against the evil and the wicked one does not lay hold get a grip on him or touch him because God keeps us from evil. Now, this is what I want to point out. It says that because the presence of the Holy Spirit is in us and he keeps us from sinning, and, and when he keeps us from sinning, the wicked one can't touch us. Why? Because sin, uh, evil, is the avenue that he can get into your life. So when you disobey, 
the, the nudging, the, the nudging or the prompting of the Holy Spirit and you do what, you, what he told you not to do, you open the door for sin of the enemy to come in and then he starts to work in your life. It's not God, it's you. It's you. You can't, listen, I don't care. If you cannot practice a lifestyle of sin and expect that the enemy won't bother you. You can't expect the power of God to be manifested in your life either. Now, this is what uh, confuses people sometimes. They'll see somebody that's uh, living a lifestyle of sin, a Christian I'm talking about, and they can see them teaching and, 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 and winning souls. You know why? Because Romans 11, 29 says the gift and callings of God are without repentance. They can be working for God, not at full force because of that sin, and eventually it's going to push them away from it. But they can be working for God and doing some work for God, but it's not working in their life, and eventually it's going to be quenched. So we say, for instance, a good, a good one is when, when we have Christians that's cohabiting, that's shacking up, that's, not, that's living together and not married, and you see, maybe you see some good things happening in their life. But see, what you don't see is that the enemy has crept in because that's a practice of sin. So the enemy has crept in, and he hasn't shown himself yet. See, he's very slick. He hasn't shown himself yet. He's trying to get in there and get rooted. So he's working the way. You might, you know, they may be experiencing some, some difficulties and they just play it off. But what it is, as the enemy starts to work in there, he's like cancer. He starts to work in there. He, he, he spreads and he wants to get rooted. And then all of a sudden he exposes himself to them. See, and all the time that he was working his way in there, they thought they was okay. They thought what they were doing was okay. Ain't nothing happening. I'm not paying the penalty. You understand? But the enemy was working his way in there. Now, he's, he's taking root, and now you're going to start seeing the fruit from that root. You're going to start seeing the fruit of the enemy. And, you know, Brother Chuck said something Sunday that's, that, that most people probably didn't even pay any attention to, but it's very profound. He said, when you are attacked, it's best to come against it before it gets on you. Because it's harder to get it off than it is to stop it. So that's the same principle here. Once the enemy gets in, man, you, got to, you better be strong in your faith to get them off. But evidence of you not being strong in your faith is the lifestyle that you live in. <laughs> you missed that, didn't you? You have to be strong in your faith to get them off, to get them out of your life. But evidence that you're not strong in your faith is that you're living or practicing a lifestyle of sin. And we like to say, well, I'm under grace. I'm un and we are. We're under grace. But grace is not an excuse to practice a lifestyle of sin. Sin is dangerous whether you're under grace or not. Sin has negative uh, results. And let me show you something about grace. Go to uh, Titus chapter 2, I believe it is, verse 11. Titus. It's around here somewhere, isn't it? It's after Timothy, isn't it? Yeah. Really? <laughs> That's a Bible principle, ain't it? I better read it from the King James because they don't use the word grace here. I want the word grace. Well, yeah, it do. Okay, the amplifier uses it. Chapter, chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 is what we're going to read. When you get there, say amen. Titus, chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. I'm reading from the Amplified. It says, For the grace of God, his unmerited favor and blessing has come forward, appeared for the deliverance from sin and the eternal salvation for all mankind. So grace has come forth to deliver us from sin and so that we can receive eternal salvation, all right? Verse 12 says, it has trained us to reject and renounce all godliness. 
it has trained us do your Bible say that? that it teaches you to reject to deny ungodliness so if you are really under grace then grace is training you not to live ungodly so you can't blame grace or use grace as an excuse to sin because if you truly under grace and operating under grace then you're living a lifestyle of faith because we access grace through faith we access grace through faith that's second I mean that's uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 we access grace through faith so if I'm in grace I'm living a lifestyle of faith because a lifestyle of faith is a lifestyle of godliness and not ungodly alright so I can't use grace as an excuse to practice sin now in 1 John we read that Christ's presence on the inside of us keeps us from evil and because we are kept from evil the wicked one can't touch you so if you're being touched and overcome by the wicked one it's not God, it's you it's your fault we don't want to hear that See, I'm going to come flat out and tell you it's your fault it ain't God's fault. Don't go get mad with the preacher. Don't get mad with God. Get mad with yourself. And sometimes you need to do that. I've done that many a time. Got upset. Well, and once I calmed down, all I had to do was say, where have I missed it, Lord? And he'll show you. He'll gently show you. He'll show you. Maybe it's somebody that you done, didn't forgive. Or maybe it's an act that he told you to do and you didn't do it. You see what I'm saying? Uh, 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 maybe it's just so obvious because you're living and practicing uh, a lifestyle of living with someone and you're not married. Some things are just obvious. Okay? But some things may not be. Are y'all all right with that? All right, back to the notes then. When we belong to Christ, we need not fear death because death is only the doorway into eternity, eternity with God. Death, death is no, nothing more to us than a door. Mm. And, the, and that door, watch this, that door leads to something great. Death to us is not a problem. Death to a believer is a blessing. You didn't want to hear that, did you? I think it's uh, I think it's either Psalm one sixteen and fifteen or Psalm one fifteen and six. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of His saints. Hallelujah, Hallelujah! And all and only thing dies is your physical body, and then when it's all said and done, you're gonna get that new body. You're going to get that new body where there's no sickness. You ain't going to need glasses to read. You ain't going to need no walker to walk. And it's going to be pain free. And you're going to be muscle. <laughs> Not women now. <laughs> talking about the men now. We talking about the men. I don't want, I don't want to see our women walking around in heaven like this here now. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. All right. Because, well, let me go back up a little bit. Paul is a great example of us in this area. He was not afraid to die because he was confident of spending eternity with Christ. Paul understood that if his earthly body died, he would step into eternity with the Lord. And we're going to 2 Corinthians 5 and 8, and we'll close there tonight. That's what Brother Chuck said. See, you, 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 you leave. You, a good storyteller, when he tells a story, he leave you hungry, hanging, to make you want to come back for more, you know. That's a good storyteller. He don't give you the, because you, now you, now you want to know, well, what's going to happen? So we'll come back. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. 
If you haven't, say, I have it. Look at Paul. Paul said, we are confident. Yes. Well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He said, you know what I like about this? He says, I'm confident of this. I'm confident that I'm well pleased to leave this body and be present with the Lord. I'm confident of that. I'm, I'm ready to go. And we're going to read verses where Paul was ready to go. He was torn between staying here and going. And to me, that verse tells, tells me the same thing that Pastor Chuck has been teaching us for the longest. That I don't have to die sick. I don't have to die a young man. I can go when I'm ready to go. Because Paul was torn between that. Paul said, you know what? I want to go, but I want to help you. I want to stay here and help you so you can understand like I understand. You understand? So he had a choice. It wasn't, he wasn't thinking about the devil because he knew who he was. The devil couldn't touch him. He, he wasn't worrying about the devil taking his life. He knew that Jesus had defeated the devil and defeated death. And Paul said, if I really, I really want to go. And see, I like this verse. And he said, I'm confident. Yes, well pleased. Rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And that, and that presence takes place immediately after your body dies. That's why I don't visit graves and talk to the people. Because all you're talking to is a coffin. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't go and even in the when viewing the bodies, I don't say, "Oh, I miss you." I did do that until I came into the knowledge. Cause that all you're looking at is the shell. It's like if you got a Cadillac out there and they don't took the motor out, it's gone. It's just a shell. No good. No use. When you go to the graveyard and you start talking, oh, I miss you. Oh, I wish you were here. You talking to dirt. <laughs> and I don't mean to be harsh, because I know people go put flowers on the grave and all that. You know what I mean? But all you doing is putting flowers on dirt. That person, when, when they... Oh, you're talking about the flower. <laughs> that person, when, they, when their body died, they, they went two places. Either one or two places. They either went to the smoking, other knows none smoking. And we know that the example of that is in Luke chapter 16, I believe it is, where it talks about Luke 12, is it Luke 16, where it talks about Lazarus and the rich man. And when, when they died, see, hell was, was uh, heaven was down there, paradise was down there with hell then. And when they died, Lazarus went to paradise in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man went to hell. And see, that also tells you that you're going to know one another. That you're going to have, see, your soul and your spirit are connected. So you're going to know. But what people don't realize is, uh, and I'm going to close with this statement. People like to say uh, a person's mind is messed up. Nobody's mind is messed up. Uh-oh, you want to get this right now, right? You know what's messed up? The brain. The mind filters through the brain. If the brain is damaged, then they, it's distorted. Their, their thinking or uh, what they want to communicate is distorted because the brain is messed up. The physical organ is messed up. That's like your physical body. It's things that you feel like you can do. You may feel like you can run a marathon, but your body says, whoa, whoa. 